Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Hannah Myers, Director of Policing and Public Safety for the Manhattan Institute. Thank you for joining us for our fourth annual lecture honoring the memory, work, and legacy of late Manhattan Institute scholar George Kelling. I remind myself over the past month that all thinking and work that protects innocent people and helps communities thrive is worthwhile. And so even as we fear for the over 200 innocent babies, women, elderly, laborers held now by Hamas terrorists in tunnels below Gaza and mourn all the innocent people who are and will suffer before the region is free from this terrorist reign, it is especially meaningful to me to be gathered together to hear and discuss consequential ideas for keeping New Yorkers and urbanites and across America and beyond safe. The Manhattan Institute's Policing and Public Safety Initiative began in 2020 to draw more people into a more nuanced conversation about criminal justice policy. We do data-based research to evaluate the impact of laws, strategies, and narratives relating to policing, prosecution, and incarceration. And we are so grateful for the insights of both practitioners and scholars, without whom it is impossible to understand the real world on the ground consequences of all of these. Tonight, we are honored to have both a scholar and a practitioner discussing an innovative perspective on crime and community dynamics. I could not think of a better way to honor George's impact. Leading criminologist Anthony Braga will present our keynote address and former NYPD and DOJ, among other agencies, senior leader Benjamin Tucker will provide a short response. Anthony and Ben will then engage with each other on the topic. And finally, we will turn it over for Q&A. It is my privilege now to introduce our keynote speaker. Anthony Braga, among many accolades and accomplishments, is the Jerry Lee Professor of Criminology and the Director of the Crime and Justice Policy Lab in the Department of Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania. He collaborates with criminal justice, social service, and community-based organizations to produce high-impact scholarship, randomized field experiments, and policy advice on the prevention of crime at problem places, the control of gang violence, and reductions in access to firearms by criminals. Anthony also served for many years as chief policy advisor to the Boston Police Commissioner. With colleagues, Anthony has published numerous peer-reviewed journal articles in top criminology and criminal justice journals, top medical and public health journals, and top sociology journals, all too numerous to mention. He has authored four books and edited nine volumes with premier presses such as the National Academies Press, Oxford University Press, and Cambridge University Press. Anthony has served as principal or co-principal investigator on projects from a variety of federal, state, and private grant-making institutions, including the US National Institute of Justice, National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and Arnold Ventures. He has served on four National Research Council committees and is a fellow of the American Society of Criminology and the 2021 recipient of its August Vollmer Award. He is also the past president and fellow of the Academy of Experimental Criminology and a recipient of its Joan McCord and, uh, Award recognizing his commitment to randomized control experiments. I, I think even Anthony is. <laughs> It's so, it's, so, it's so impressive. Anthony's work in violence reduction is dis in disadvantaged neighborhoods has been recognized by the Civic Leadership Award, the US Attorney General's Award for Outstanding Contributions to co Community Partnerships for Public Safety, and the US Department of Justice Project Safe Neighborhoods Research Partner of the Year Award. He holds degrees from Harvard and Rutgers universities. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. I really do appreciate it. And thank you to the Manhattan Institute for hosting me here. I wanted to start my talk with, is this the, oh, sorry, I was hitting the wrong button. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about policing as public health uh, and taking in a sort of updated view of broken windows. And I wanted to start my lecture by just acknowledging George Kelling as the visionary of police reform that he was and the good mentor that he also was to a generation of police leaders and scholars. Now, George, he you know, is a legend in police research. He was the author of the Kansas City Preventive Patrol Experiment, which found that varying levels of random patrol across larger areas of the city were not associated with crime rates. 
He looked at the effects of getting officers out of their cars and onto the streets in the Newark Foot Patrol experiment, which found even though overall crime didn't go down in these areas, that citizens felt better about their neighborhoods and they felt better about the police. And the police also felt better about the relationships with citizens. And when you looked at specific areas within that experiment in Newark, you found that there were strong crime reductions. And this was due to some of the order maintenance activities that the officers on the ground were doing. And this led James Q. Wilson and George Kelling to come up with the broken windows theory, which I'll be talking about a lot in my presentation. You know, but some of you might, kn might know all of that and know his contributions to crime control policy and might not know, you know what a generous and kind man he was. And he certainly was a generous and kind man with me when I was a young PhD student. Uh, and I got my first job when I mes met him at Harvard Kennedy School as a researcher in the program in criminal justice. Uh, he would take time, took interest in me. Uh, he would give me advice. And two pieces of advice really stood out. The first was that you really need to get out of your office, get out into the community, talk to police officers who are on the beat, talk to community members if you really want to understand something about crime policy. Uh, and George walked the walk on that. I remember uh, some of my work with the Boston Police Department. I was in an unmarked car looking at the, uh, a, in the downtown area of Boston, Boston Common, uh, watching a, sort of a drug market area that was, was operating there. Uh, it was you know, taking place amongst a transient population with a lot of homeless folks. And you know, talking to the officer, we noticed that the Boston Police Department's street outreach team came up on bicycles. And there was 75-year-old George Kelling on a bicycle with the street cops, got off of, the, off, off of his bike, went up to some of the folks in the area, spoke with them, the homeless folks. He really wanted to understand the dynamic of what was going on, worked with the police officers to fry, figure out how do we create a safe environment in this area for all. Uh, and that really shaped the way I've done a lot of my work. It really was a privilege to, to know him. The second is you know, a bit of advice that has shaped my career uh, you know, from the outset. And that was when police pay attention to problems, when they pay attention to the little things, the community benefits. And these benefits can be profound. And with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, broken windows. I'm surprised by how many people you know, speak about broken windows as if they're experts. And it's clear they haven't even read the first article that was released in 1982. Completely mischaracterized. So I think it's worth just walking you know, the audience through what was meant by, uh, by broken windows when it was first proposed. The first part is that you have neighborhoods that have social disorder, social incivilities, such as uh, loitering, public drinking, you know, street walking, prostitution. You have physical disorder, vacant lots, trash, abandoned building. And this inspires fear. And the fear causes stable families to move out. Those that can move out do. Other families who remain, they isolate themselves and they take self-protective -protect measures. People start not knowing who belongs. People stop interacting with each other. And anonymity increases an informal social control or the capacity of a community to exert their own control over public spaces, which is really the key to public safety, uh, goes down. Now, as disorder continues to escalate and control continues to decrease, it sends signals to more serious offenders that nobody cares and that this is a good location to commit crime. And this theory proposed the basic insight that Crime occurred because the police and residents didn't work together in the first place to do something about this cycle of decay. They, they didn't disrupt this developmental sequence of crime. It is, at its heart, an epidemic theory, you know, that crime is contagious and it can move from neighborhood to neighborhood based on environmental features. And you really needed to take that step to control 
the disorder before it spread to other neighborhoods and caused great harm to citizens that lived there. That's the crux of the theory. You get, in some areas, versions of the theory that makes you think it's zero tolerance policing. There are other components that might make you think that it is some master plan to criminalize poor people or to uh, you know, focus enforcement on communities of color. That's not at all what was meant uh, by broken windows in the original version that, that was proposed. And the idea, and this is some conversations that I had with George in, in saying, hey, you know, how do you think about how mischaracterized this idea has become? And he said, well, you know, admittedly, when we first talked about broken windows in our original article, we were a little bit vague. And we just put out the proposition that you know, police needed to support communities uh, by maintaining order. That this order would, in, by their order maintenance activities, it would allow communities to stand on their own. Then in subsequent articles, 1989 article, uh, his excellent book with his wife, Catherine Coles, Fixing Broken Windows. You know, it really crystallized as an idea to support community and problem-oriented policing. Uh, and this was really the crux of Broken Windows, thinking about community and problem-oriented policing. And one of my favorite essays that George wrote a little bit later, and this is reflecting upon you know, concerns that he had over zero tolerance and too much enforcement that may have been going on by police departments that misunderstood the approach, or on the other hand, people who were mischaracterizing the, the approach as harmful. And he said, hey, we actually meant this as a metaphor. We meant this to inspire people to be creative and to think differently about crimes and communities. Uh, unfortunately, the downside of metaphors, as he wrote in this essay in the Journal of Research in Crime and Delinquency, is that they're abstract and they can be subject to misinterpretation. And then on the subject of you know, increasing, you know, without focus, uh, the number of stops and arrests, he said, what? We never said or intimated that. Um, and it was a reflection on the types of ideas that he really wanted you know, folks to be focused on when they think about broken windows, community problem solving. And when you do focus on disorder, you can control crime but it's really dependent on how it's done. If you do it in a way that's consistent with George Callan's vision, uh, you can have significant crime control effects. So some of the work that I had done that has been inspired by George, the first was a randomized experiment in Lowell, Massachusetts, a relatively small former mill town in northern Massachusetts, where we collaborated with the police department identified uh, violent crime hotspots and challenged them to do problem-oriented policing there. They didn't quite do problem-oriented policing the way Herman Goldstein envisioned in terms of doing rigorous analyses. They more did on-the-spot appraisals and did things that seemed to make sense to them. And they, order, they ended up implementing what I would call shallow problem, problem solving or a strategy that very much looked like broken windows or policing disorder. And that produced a 20% reduction in crime with little evidence of displacement. They weren't just pushing crime around the corner. These were real crime control gains. We collected, with the help of the police department, a lot of information in the treated areas and the untreated areas, what the police were doing there. So we were able to unravel some of the dynamics, what mattered most in this strategy. What mattered most were the situational changes that they made cleaning up areas, you know, dealing with those vacant lots, raising abandoned buildings, changing the lighting, doing different kinds of situational interventions to change those disorderly conditions. They also made some misdemeanor arrests, of course. I mean, arrests are necessary. Arrests are part of what police do. Holding people accountable is necessary. Uh, so as part of this strategy, they did in increase some arrests. And it did have an effect, it was a small effect, you know, but it was a meaningful effect. But most of it was changing the nature of the places. So it wasn't just about arresting people. It was about trying to change those underlying dynamics at these locations that cause crimes to recur. Another review uh, that I did with some colleagues 
We looked at 30 studies, uh, randomized experiments and quasi-experiments, looking at policing disorder interventions. And we found overall, dealing with disorder controls crime. It controls violent crime, property crime, drug crime. However, when you looked at the types of interventions that were being launched in this group of studies, what was driving this overall finding were the ones that were doing community problem solving, you know, focusing on places. And again, arrests are part of that strategy. But it wasn't a one-dimensional part of the strategy. It wasn't the only thing that police were doing. Police were developing relationships with communities. Police were trying to get communities involved in crime prevention strategies. The programs that were evaluated, evaluated that were included that, with that review that just focused on the uh, one-dimensional arrest strategy, small effects on crime that weren't significant, weren't noteworthy. So if you wanted to use this approach to control crime, you really should be thinking about it in the way that James Q. Wilson and George Kelling initially envisioned, as a community problem-solving type of strategy not a one-dimensional enforcement-only strategy. Uh, but clearly, it works. Anybody who says dealing with disorder is not meaningful has not looked at the evidence and they're not being honest in public policy debates. Uh, policing disorder absolutely matters. Now, public health approaches, especially over the last couple of years, have really come into vogue. And I collaborate with a lot of public health researchers. I mean, there are things about public health that are very important and that I think are completely compatible with different models of policing that focus on crime control. Now, some of the strengths of a public health approach to crime control, I mean, to public health approach to thinking about serious violence, one is their commitment to getting all stakeholders involved. You know, that anybody who has a piece of a problem should be at the table and talking about how do we deal with that problem. You know, I think that's a very important value. Second is applying epidemiology, understanding underlying risk factors, what's going wrong, so we can implement logically linked responses to those risk factors, so we can prevent problems from recurring. Uh, so taking that sort of analytic approach is very, very important. Declaring something a public health crisis is also very strategic. Uh, it motivates, it, it also it engage and allows you to connect with more partners. You know, people, when they say it's a public health crisis relative to a criminal justice crisis, you frame things as a criminal justice crisis, they'll say, oh, well, that's the police, that's the courts, that's corrections, they've got that. Public health crisis, you can get schools, you can get social workers, you can get a whole range of people interested in intervening. So that's a benefit of uh, public health approaches. And another value is the idea of harm reduction. And by that I mean avoiding unintended consequences and thinking about that very carefully and seriously. However, despite these ideals, some of the limitations is many in the public health field aren't walking the walk on all available stakeholders, especially since 2020. They've excluded the criminal justice system, and they've excluded, in particular, the police. And I think that's to the detriment of uh, many public health uh, responses. Another issue is, and I'm thinking about in the area of gun violence, uh, if you look at the CDC's Vital Signs Report on gun violence, you know, one of the strategies that they suggest to control gun violence you know, is to do something about poverty. And obviously, you know, we should be doing something about poverty. Poverty is important to deal with. Um, you know, but, you know, interventions such as housing assistance, as well as um, subsidies for childcare, I don't think are very directly connected to the real nature of gun violence problems in many cities. They could have some long-term effect, you know, but, you know, in the time that we're waiting for these types of interventions to take hold, you're going to have a lot of people dying. So you really need to think about what are short-term responses and how these short-term responses can support these longer-term strategies. So, for example, you could have the best after-school program in the world. You know, however, if young people you know, are afraid to go to this pr program because the streets are out of control, 
or they think they need to carry a gun to get there safely, how effective can that program be? So you really need to think about you know, supporting these longer term interventions with short term interventions. And when you look at what's been put forward uh, in the name of public health, uh, there's not a lot of substantive interventions that you can seek your teeth into. The first you know, being CVI, community violence intervention, or street outreach work. It's a very murky concept when you think about street outreach programs. There's lots of different ways that these programs are implemented, uh, whether they're part of city government, whether they're nonprofits, whether they're doing violence interruption work, you know, whether they're trying to negotiate gang truces, whether they're trying to get people involved in services. It's not surprising, given all the variety, that these programs, at least the evaluations, show very mixed effects. You know, some might reduce crime, you know, others have null effects, and some have been shown to actually make things worse, increases in shootings. One of the strategies that are, that's very effective, uh, that's connected to street outreach workers, because I think street outreach workers are very important in connecting people who are disconnected from government and opportunity, you know, is focused deterrence. You know, however, if you look at the public health literature on focused deterrence, they scarcely acknowledge the police role in, in focused deterrence. You would not get a real description of what it is for street outreach workers to partner with police, to partner with community in order to prevent that next shooting from happening. Uh, hospital intervention programs, uh, there's not a lot of evidence there yet. We don't know whether those work. The programs that have been evaluated haven't shown that they really focus in on the people who are most at risk of committing a shooting. So there's questionable efficacy there. One intervention where there's very rigorous evidence is greening vacant lots. And you know, there have been randomized trials, one very well known uh, run by my colleague, uh, John McDonald, uh, as well as Charlie Brannis and Gina South in Philadelphia. And it showed that cleaning up vacant lots does reduce violence. However, this is somewhat old wine in new bottles. Uh, it's something that the police departments have been doing and thinking about for a very long time. You know, how do we leverage cleaning up lots, securing abandoned buildings as part of a problem-solving strategy in order to reduce crime? So there's real limits to the current state of public health interventions in forming a robust response. However, now there is reason to believe that you can get policing and public health together in a meaningful way. Uh, this is a, a um, view of the basics of the public health model. You know, first, you define the problem, you collect data, you set up your surveillance systems, then you do your epidemiology, you identify your risk factors, then based on that work, you implement, you do your interventions, you try and figure out whether it's working, then you continue to refine them and disseminate knowledge. That's the basics of the public health approach. To a lot of the folks in the room, you know, some of the police managers in the room in particular, this might look very familiar because it's the same action research model that undergirds a lot of social science inquiries and it does form the basis of problem-oriented policing, um, which is part of a community policing strategy, doing your scanning, your analysis, your response, and your assessment. It's essentially the same approach, but very few people recognize you know, public health and strategic policing as being completely compatible in this sort of way. So some of the issues in terms of uh, looking at uh, keeping you know, public health and policing, you know, recognizing them as, as complements, um, you know, one is that uh, these public health interventions really do need the criminal justice system. Uh, and it used to be that they would recognize that. For example, if you look at drunk driving literature, you go to the American Public Health Association's webpage, you know, they talk about policing interventions very clearly as part of a public health approach. They talk about generating deterrence by increasing the blood alcohol level. 
They talk about doing um, uh, saturation patrols and hot spots of uh, crash accidents that are driven by drunk driving to detect and deter drunk drivers. They talk about police doing stings, sending people into establishments to make sure they're not serving minors. And this was part of the recommendations for a public health approach. So very clearly, uh, public health you know, can embrace these policing con uh, concepts and they have in the past. Another issue is there are some situations where you just need the police. If you go to the Philadelphia Horticultural Society's webpage, they've greened more than 24,000 lots in Philadelphia. However, Philadelphia still has record high levels of homicides. You can't just green your way out of a problem. I'm currently working on a randomized experiment with my colleague John McDonald and the Philadelphia Horticultural Society looking at picking up trash from streets in, in Philadelphia and its effects on violence. However, when we were selecting the locations that we would include in our study, they said, okay, well, we can't go to these locations because it's too dangerous there. There were a number of places in Kensington where they said, we can't do this public health intervention because it's too out of control and we don't want our cleanup crews you know, being the victims of crime. So clearly, you need the police there. You know, the police need to be able to enforce the law, work with the community, establish some base level of civility there so you can start doing this cleanup. You know, so you do need them to be complements working together. Uh, also, if you exclude the police from a public health approach, you're not going to get the full picture of the nature of violence, undermining the epidemiology that they're trying to do. Police have data that's very critical on the nature of violence. In most serious violence, shootings, gun violence in cities, concentrated amongst a very small number of people who are very well known to the criminal justice system, who are caught up in high-risk networks such as gangs, drug-selling crews, and other criminally active groups. And if you don't work with the police, you wouldn't have those insights to design an effective prevention strategy. Now, for the police, there's lots to, lots to gain by, gener by embracing these public health concepts. You know, the first of which is that it really reinforces the idea of community and problem-solving policing. You know, this idea of engaging all stakeholders, you know, that's community policing 101. The idea of doing analytical work, epidemiology, that's problem-oriented policing. And it supports the idea of dealing with broken windows. Uh, so, a marriage between policing and public health would be beneficial to getting police departments back to really doubling down on community and problem-oriented policing. Also, it would help mobilize partners, you know, saying, you know, going to neighborhoods and framing things as a public health crisis rather than simply a serious crime problem, which can exclude some people who might, you know, be important parts of a solution to crime in a particular neighborhood, as well as thinking about harm reduction. And I know a lot of police leaders you know, think about these issues uh, very carefully, but they should be front and center. Uh, thinking about minimizing harmful racial disparities, thinking about the, the negative effects of overuse of the criminal justice system. Uh, and you know, these are important things to be thinking about. I spent the first half of my career mostly trying to figure out whether the, the police can control crime. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. When police are focused, they engage a wide range of partners and they take an analytical approach, they can control crime. However, I've spent the second half of my career saying, how can we control crime in a way that doesn't generate undue harm to communities? How can we do it in a way that doesn't you know, increase racial disparities or create you know, people who are unemployable? And that's not to say that we shouldn't be holding people accountable but there are many ways to control problems. And this is completely consistent with thinking about broken windows because the basic idea behind broken windows is to prevent events from happening by changing underlying dynamics. You know, it doesn't necessarily follow that you have to invoke the criminal justice system to take that sort of preventive approach. You, know, you can head that stuff off by changing things. So in terms of thinking about 
fixing broken windows is public health. You know, some of the key ideas. First, you know, is to recognize that if you were taking a public health approach, it'd be very evident to people uh, in the public health field, and it's becoming increasingly so with their focus on greening vacant lots, that people want orderly, safe environments. They don't want to feel scared going from their home down the street to a store to get groceries. They don't want to step over human waste. They want safe, orderly environments. And we need to think about that, and we need to take, a, take that seriously. Uh, and you know, when people are, face this, they want the police to do something. You know, and thinking about broken windows is an important uh, step to do that. Um, the research is clear. You know, crime and disorder are highly correlated. In some places, the disorderly conditions cause crime. So we need to do something about that disorder in order to be effective at preventing crime. Uh, informal social control really matters. Trying to support neighborhoods in ways that they can control public spaces themselves is a key idea of broken windows, and it's something that public health uh, folks really embrace, the idea of strengthening communities. Uh, so having police operate in that way is very consistent with a public health ideal. Uh, these ideas of unintended harms, uh, trying to minimize them, sidestep them, very, very important as well. Now, it's not easy, especially in today's climate, to think about you know, how do we do broken windows. Um, you know, convinced there are lots of different issues. You know, here are just, just two of the many issues. You know, one being, uh, how do we get prosecutors to accept these low-level cases? You know, how do we get judges to think about you know, uh, giving people who might be arrested in these cases? Uh, sentences as appropriate. Um, you know, other issues include uh, how do we get adequate police uh, staffing? I mean, police departments are in a crisis, not having enough officers. It's difficult to be strategic and implement community problem solving if you don't have enough officers uh, to answer basic calls for service and do basic investigations. So we need to think about those, those different issues as well. You know, however, you know, when I look, I step back, I think about the directions that crime control is going, I think about what the scientific evidence says. I think broken windows today is as relevant as it was when it was first thought up in the early 1980s, uh, and it should really be a focal point of policing going forward. Thank you. I'm going to introduce uh, Ben Tucker. Um, ben Tucker, in some ways, needs no introduction. Uh, my eyes are not as good as Hannah's, so I can't read his entire uh, bio, which is incredibly impressive. Uh, ben has been doing this, and he knows more about policing than, you know, he's probably forgotten more about policing than I will ever know. Uh, he started in 1969 as a police trainee, uh, joined the NYPD, and became a patrol officer in 1972. And over those next, seven, next 22 years working at the NYPD, he performed a range of different uniformed and plainclothes assignments uh, and uh, ended up being the deputy commissioner of legal matters and the assistant director of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Then he worked for the city, working for Mayor Ed Koch as the deputy assistant of director for law enforcement service in the mayor's office of operations. Uh, he also served for Michael Bloomberg as a chief executive of school safety and planning for the department, uh, chief executive for school safety and planning for the Department of Education. In 1995, President Clinton appointed uh, him the deputy director of the newly formed Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. He also served. Uh, for President Obama. He was nominated as the Deputy Director for State, Local, and Tribal Affairs within the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. And then he had a second stint with the NYPD when Bill Bratton uh, also have it, had a second stint with the NYPD, uh, being the first Deputy Commissioner, or essentially the number two in charge of the police department. And that's when I had the privilege of working with him on a a few different projects, including body-worn cameras. And since his retirement in December of 2021, 
Uh, he's been appointed a trustee of the Northwell Health Board of Trustees, and he's become an academic. We could really use him. <laughs> he's a tenured professor at Pace University. So, Ben Tucker. All right, Anthony, thank you. Good evening. Uh, so, Hannah, where's Hannah? Thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, Hannah and I had a conversation that we had scheduled for about 30 minutes initially. She had some questions and, and, and we, caught, we talked. And two hours later, we, we hung up. Uh, and, and so I think that may have had something to do with her calling me when she wanted to let me know that Anthony uh, was going to be uh, the keynote um, uh, for the fourth annual uh, George Kelling lecture, which is, which is pretty incredible. And, and, and I don't know about you, I thought he did a great job, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> And so my role uh, this afternoon is to um, respond and just to, to, to sort of give some perspective or add my perspective to um, the thesis that, that Anthony has proposed regarding uh, policing public health. And, um, and I, I come at it in a variety of ways, but one of the ways that, that is most recent is has to do with the, um, my appointment as a trustee at Northwell. And so I've gotten a perspective on the, 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 the uh, public health perspective that I match with my, my practitioner uh, perspective as a, as a police officer for so many years. Uh, so anyway, that, with that in mind, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm, I wanna continue um, with my with my with my formal remarks, but first, uh, I also need to uh, use this opportunity to honor George's memory and his legacy in particular, Catherine. That, that um, George Kelling's legacy is as Anthony gave you the, the long and short of it. So I won't go into any more detail, uh, but I also share wanted to share. Uh, his, when he shared his his work, the work that he was doing uh, in his career and has done, um, I was a, a beneficiary of, of that work. The studies that that uh, that Anthony referenced, Kansas City, Newark, and, and so many others, the research. Um, I was a, a young cop in the in the 70s, and and um, working in precincts, you know, all across the city, and. Um, and, 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 and that, that work, um, that body of work, um, I took it to heart, uh, embracing his ideas, his research, um, uh, how it informs policy and, and imp the implications for not just policy, but operations, all those police people and, and prosecutors in the room, um, at a minimum, understand you know, strategy, training, community engagement, and more, uh, and certainly those those come up in, in a variety of ways as part of a discussion around public health and uh, and public safety. So I had the opportunity to, to be influenced by George. I hadn't met him. Uh, I knew his work in the 70s and in the 80s. I was still in the department. and always believed in uh, the work, it was sound, the research, and, and um, so that was fantastic, just to be able to, to, um, to uh, 20 years later, to, to have the privilege of meeting George uh, when I was at the Clinton Justice Department. And, and we had, um, you know, that opportunity for me was, uh, this is a giant criminology, in criminology and, and he was a person who, um, gave me uh, uh, the time of day uh, when we met, and and we because uh, the cops office was brand new and we were rolling it out and had its mandate to in increase uh, uh, sworn officers around the country, but also to adopt community policing. Uh, we had a number of, of conversations, George and and our team uh, at the cops office around those issues, and then 19 years later, 
uh, in 2014, as, as Anthony referenced, uh, when, when Bill Bratton became PC for the second time uh, and asked me to come back, uh, I joined the team. And to my surprise, uh, uh, George was one of the consultants uh, involved with, um, you know, the, uh, uh, with the team. And, and we engaged in, in uh, what I would call uh, the relentless pursuit of, of, uh, uh, of the unprecedented transformation of the NYPD. Uh, it is, um, it's a story that is yet untold, but, but it is very much, I think, related to tonight's topic. Um, because so much of, as I listened to, to Anthony's presentation, there are people in this room, I could point to Chauncey, I could point to Terry Tobin and, and others, uh, to give you a sense of, of those ideas that, that Anthony spoke about when it comes to stakeholders, when it comes to um, disorder and how we handle it, when it, you know, and, and policies and practices um, in terms of focusing on, on, the, on the specific challenges around gun violence, uh, as, a, as, as, as an example. Um, in any case, unfortunately, our work at that time uh, took place in, in the context of a heated uh, national debate uh, about policing uh, and the abuse of, of police power. Uh, and police community relations uh, in, the, uh, in the city here and across the country um, were, were frayed, uh, those relationships were frayed. And Broken Windows, windows uh, Theory fell victim to, to the scathing criticism uh, driving, uh, driven by uh, zero tolerance and, and also racist policing. That was the, the mantra. So uh, still George, never wavered in his beliefs and, and, in, 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 and in, in reality, his impact on, on the profession, as Anthony mentioned, was a gift to policing uh, and communities across the country. Uh, so this evening, I, as I begin my response uh, to Dr. Braga's keynote, uh, it's clear to me, just a, a couple of comments about, about, about Anthony, uh, it's clear to me that, that his thesis embodies his thoughtfulness, his thoughtful vision, and uh, his wisdom and his values, um, and, and almost, uh, 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 most importantly, his pragmatism about, I, I look at it as the, ga the, the glass being half full, you know, you, you know with all the, the challenges, and we know the climate that we're, li that we're living in today, um, you, you, I start with the glass being half full and never let it go b b below that, because I think if it did, then we'd all be squandering to figure out what, what we can do to, or whether we can make a difference in anything that we try. And so uh, my remarks, are, um, he reflected, uh, Anthony re reflected uh, his, uh, his, relations on his relationship with George, and, and so you've heard mine, um, and how much the, uh, Anthony valued George's insights uh, and sage advice up close and personal as a mentor in my, re in my position uh, early or on in the 70s um, and into the 80s. It was more influence as opposed to mentorship. But, but, but nevertheless, uh, extraordinarily pow powerful. And then Anthony re referenced, you know, some of, gave you some examples. And, and, and those examples are, I think, important. You know, get out of your office, go into the field, do the work, and also the idea that when police uh, pay attention to problems, the community benefits. Oh, they're fundamental, and they sound simple, and they are simple truths. Uh, however, those simple truths will be put to test, to the test in light of, of, of the negative sentiment around broken windows by many who see broken windows as the tip of the spear um, for aggressive police tactics in communities of color across the country, as well as here in the city. And surely, this is one of the many factors to be considered, uh, and we can talk more about this in the conversation, but, but one of the many factors to be considered um, with respect to the efficacy of, of, of your thesis, uh, the thesis we discussed this, afternoon, uh, this evening. Uh, Anthony looked back and reliance on the article um, authored by Wilson and Kelly, Kelling was, um, was it, 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 it is 
um, the perspective on crime and, and, and uh, disorder and the decline in uh, neighborhoods seemed an appropriate place to begin because it bears witness to the stark reality of what happens when police and community fail to share responsibility uh, for creating safe, safe communities. But that's, that's in, in, in my time in the job uh, as a trainee uh, and, and then as a young cop, uh, it, 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 was, it seemed like it made sense always to be able to communicate and to work with communities who had problems. And, and you didn't need the labels or the, 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 you know, the description um, uh, of what you would call it, but rather it just was basic. Uh, and so it seems like, if, and so Anthony's point about where we end up with respect to um, the results, you know, in terms of what the fallout is, uh, is, is, a, is a reality, and, I've, and, and people in this room who have been in policing have seen it time and time again in, in reality, uh, where social and, and physical uh, instabilities uh, uh, and serious crime uh, are the result of inaction on the part of community to really engage and on the part of policing. Uh, and, and, and in addition, I strongly believe that, uh, that um, the issue of trust is is absolutely essential in, in this regard. It looms large with respect to the issue of police legitimacy in the eyes of the community uh, and in the eyes, of, and, and, and for example, if people uh, in the community are, are treated with dignity, dignity and respect uh, by the police, in other words, treated in a manner that they perceive is fair and just, uh, then they will be more likely to to embrace and voluntarily comply with the law. And, and it, that concept is, 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 is not new, it is basic, but it is one that, that is from the time uh, of and the creation of, of policing, paid policing, um, under, say, Sir Robert Peel, the founder of the London Metropolitan Police. His vision he understood this very well, and his vision uh, in the form of, of his nine principles uh, that he laid down as the bedrock for his tenants to his people at the time, his new officers. I believe the, the following principles are as relevant today uh, as they were 194 years ago. So on the subject of, of use of force, which is a challenge that we continue to face today, uh, Peel said this, he said, police use physical, use, uh, uh, use physical force uh, to the extent necessary to secure observance of the law or to restore order only uh, when the exercise of or, or persuasion, advice, and, and warning is found to be insufficient. And that's, we don't teach it in that language today, but, but we, we really do try to have our officers understand why it's important to think about it that way. And on the subject of, of gaining public trust, uh, Peel said to recognize always, to, said to his cops, to recognize always the extent to which cooperation of the, of the public can be, secured, can be secured diminishes proportionality uh, uh, excuse me, the cooperation of, of the public can be secured diminishes proportionately uh, to the necessity of the use of physical force and compulsion for achieving uh, police objectives. And then finally, uh, this last, one of this, this is the third of, 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 of the nine um, on the subject of police um, and, and, and community responsibility, police at all times uh, should maintain a relationship with the public that gives rise to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. So Anthony's vision uh, to marry police with the public, with public health as a scientific approach to prevention, um, I think is compelling. Uh, the, uh, the definition is, is pretty broad. Uh, it, it's an approach um, to improving individual community health 
through prevention and treatment of disease and other physical and mental conditions uh, by promoting healthy behaviors. What's interesting about this, this particular um, approach is that, as Anthony pointed out, it, it sometimes leaves police out of the mix. But the reality is, and I think people who have who've been in the streets would tell you that, that you know, it is, it is very often, um, and, and, and it is today, uh, the practice of police and just the, the work that they do daily takes them into this world. And you can't avoid it, it's inescapable. And it's come up time and time again. Um, you know, I, I think over in recent years, the, 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 the real challenge for, for, for the department had been uh, concerns by the public that we should not be engaged in um, responding to cases of individuals who suffer from mental illness. And of course, that is, is, is you know, and, and that is an issue that's not new. We, we were dealing with it in the Koch administration, and, and even then, uh, with Ben Ward and Bill Grinker, we came up with uh, a proposal uh, to, to take back to the mayor, which was really about uh, co-response. And, and uh, so we very much engage in that. It didn't, it wasn't implemented back then because even as we were briefing the mayor on it, uh, it we understood that, that, the, that the cost of it was just prohibitive and, and how you could put together the, the, the necessary resources to, to support that type of a model. Uh, we're doing a bit better at it today. Uh, Chief Tobin is here. She can, she can talk more about it uh, as well, but, but that is, that is uh, uh, a challenge. Uh, in terms of uh, the efficacy of this model, uh, uh, it, I think it has broader uh, application uh, to, to, to violent prevention, violence prevention, gun, gun violence, uh, substance abuse disorder, and, and crime prevention, as well as harm reduction, uh, reduction, uh, uh, harm reduction, as you mentioned, Anthony. Um, harm reduction takes various uh, shapes, uh, but it is, it is something that's been controversial uh, in its approach. Um, I, 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 um, I think I can comment on, on, uh, on my involvement in, in what could be classified as harm reduction in that, you know, when I was at the Drug Policy Office, one of the things that, that Gil Kralikowski and I realized is that we really did need to, uh, we were focused on treatment, uh, we were focused on recovery, uh, and, 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 and we needed to, when we, when we learned and were briefed on, on the use of naloxone and Narcan, uh, it was clear to, clear to us that we, is, we should uh, approach the, uh, the policing community in, in, across the country to, to, to share with them our view that, that um, officers ought to be carrying naloxone uh, uh, when they're working. And so we, we, we moved it in that direction. And uh, we briefed the IACP Dangerous Drugs and Narcotics Committee on, on, on the efficacy of uh, what we believe Narcan could do. And, um, and they adopted it, and now it's ubiquitous uh, across the country. I think it is, um, and it saved lives. So it's made a, a, huge, a huge impact. But that's just one example of, and, it, and it's not been, you know, I think you could call it harm reduction. Uh, but, but to any number of other areas where harm reduction uh, makes sense. Moreover, um, the, the, the public health model emphasis, uh, uh, emphasizes input from, uh, and, and colla uh, from, from collaboration with uh, a wide range of diverse um, uh, sectors, community health, uh, education, social services, and so forth. On the issue of stakeholders and, 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 and we'll talk more about that, I guess, in a moment when I'm through, uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, you know it's, it's, it's a word we use, but, it, but it is, it's not really defined. It's only defined by the necessary, the necessary people you need to bring to the table to address the particular issue that, uh, that, uh, that, you're, that you're struggling with or whatever problem you have. Uh, and that's where, when, when you're thinking about it in that context, leadership becomes uh, paramount. Uh, and I think so much of, of whether or not we get traction with uh, initiatives that we, that we seek to impl implement 
and whether or not they are implemented properly or as we designed it uh, really um, has to do with whether or not the message comes from the top down into uh, the folks who are on the ground, the boots on the ground, and whether or not uh, uh, they are doing what they need to do to use that um, uh, uh, effectively. So as such, th this approach is complementary to policing, uh, and, and Anthony sp spoke about that as it applies virtually uh, the same type of framework and, and approach uh, to uh, uh, use by police in, in problem solving. Uh, so we have that in common, and, and I think the thesis uh, in terms of its efficacy going forward, um, that, that would make, that would make perfect sense. And Braga acknowledged uh, the strengths and, 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 uh, of the public health model as well as some of the limitations. So I won't go into those in any detail, but, but they all are, uh, you've heard them and they, and they are, I think, persuasive. Uh, and, and, but I also think it demonstrates that, that we're more alike than, than, un, un, than, than not, and that, and that is a really uh, important with respect to what we want to do going forward uh, as, we, as we think about uh, this problem. So, in conclusion, let me, let me just say that, that um, Anthony's thesis couldn't be more timely. Uh, and that uh, I say that because according to a recent study updating uh, and supplementing uh, previous U.S. crime reports, uh, trends uh, reports uh, with additional crime data up through June of, of this year, um, and this was a study uh, performed by the Council on Criminal Justice, the following uh, is worth noting. And, 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 and studies suggest that though the level of, of serious crime is far below historical peaks, it remains intolerably high uh, compared uh, uh, to 2019, uh, this year prior to uh, the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic and racial justice protests of, 20, uh, of 2020, especially in communities of color. The study goes on to say that research has, has been identified, uh, has identified strategies that, that work to reduce violence and improve fairness um, and the effectiveness of, of policing. And in the current climate, by most any measure, the level and impact of, of disorder and uh, serious crime is, is visceral, uh, and in my view, uppermost in, in people's minds more than ever before. And so for this reason, uh, the uh, suggestions uh, and, and the, the, the discussion around uh, and uh, Anthony's uh, thesis makes uh, a, a solid case for a new and creative uh, approach uh, that would complement and strengthen the strategies that, that we all know um, uh, uh, are effective. So as I close, I'll leave you with uh, <laughs> some additional food for thought regarding uh, the, the thesis. Uh, and, I, and, and really, it's just a couple of questions that I, I think, given the current climate, um, as public, poli public and, and policy makers uh, think about effective strategies to address crime and disorder in this context, what barriers uh, need to overcome, uh, need to be over overcome, uh, and, and what questions uh, need to be asked uh, with respect to uh, uh, the, the public health uh, approach. And then second, how can we, in this room, many of us practitioners, academics, policy makers, um, and citizens think about and help assess the efficacy of adopting police, policing uh, uh, public health, uh, the policing public health approach. So I'll leave it there. Um, and then Anthony and I are going to have a conversation, I think, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you.